Look at this place. Impressive, huh? It's incredible. I mean, we could be in the Grand Canyon right now. Okay, so why are we here? The reason we're here is that this was an ancient fortress of the Edomites. The Edomites. How well do you remember your Old Testament? Oh, flawless, <laughs> like the like the inside of a Denny's menu. Um, I kind of remember this. There's uh, Jacob and the, the 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. is where we get Israel, right? And then he has a brother. Esau. Esau. Yeah. Esau establishes the kingdom of the Edomites. Yes, and they're one of several kingdoms in this area at that time, 1250 BC. OK, so we're like a 1,000 years before the Nabataeans. Yeah. All right, so what do the Edomites have to do with the Nabataeans? Look up on this cliff face and tell me what you see. Uh, okay. On the cliff. I'm looking for caves. I'm looking for tombs. I don't see either. Well, start up at the cut in the rock in the top, uh -huh. and then come straight down until you find some right angles. Oh, that's square. Is that carved in the rock? That is. What is that? That's an ancient inscription. That's an inscription? Yeah. Can we read it? And there's the rub. Out of about 100 lines, we can only read about six or seven. And what we can read says what? It tells us what happened to the Edomites and how it sets up the Nabataean world. So how do we read more of it? We need to scan it. There's never been a digital scan of this done. All right, can it be scanned from here? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no! No! We only need to be like this close. No, it's a sheer cliff face, man. I called some friends. No. They're waiting for us. Come on, let's get the packs in the car and let's do it. No! I'm not gonna answer your calls anymore. It's a long, long way up. Not exactly a leisurely hike under the best of circumstances, and in the summer heat, it's downright punishing. Okay, this sucks. <laughs> Fortunately, as we reach the top, it's clear that we're not on our own. Pierce Paul has called in an advanced team, including master repeller Marwan Maita, to help us examine the inscription on the cliff face. How's it going? I'm tired, that's how it's going. Yeah, it's quite a ways up. It's quite a ways up. OK, how far a drop is this? From the top to the bottom, it's two football fields. Will we be hands-free there to be able to scan? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We will be lowering you guys. OK, should we get kitted up? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Sure. Let's do it. Come on. Yeah. We gear up to head down. Safety first, I hope. The rappel platform has already been set up on the cliff face. So we clip in and make our way to the edge, 700 feet above the ground. Oh, my word. All right, we got the scanner clipped to you. OK, yep, I have a scanner here, yep. So you're going to have to deploy it when we get down there. Why am I going first again? Because you have the scanner. That's the ticket. Because I have the scanner, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. But why did I have to have? Doesn't matter. OK, here we go. To scan the inscription up close, we'll need to dangle about 30 feet below the platform. The ground, that thing I'm hoping to kiss in a few hours, that's another 650 feet below. This is officially terrifying. Here's Paul, see you in a minute. <sighs> Calm your nerves. Calm your nerves. OK. I see the inscription, it's below me. This is scary. Keep going. Keep going. A little bit more. I'm almost at the top. Copy that. Keep going. I'm at the top of the inscription. A little lower. A little more. OK, stop. That's good. Copy that. Hang in there. Pierce is on his way down. Coming down, buddy. Yep. You got it, man. Nice and slow. Going as slow as I can. OK, you're on it. It's the very top. Yeah. A little bit more. Hold. Finally, my cameraman Ryan makes the trip down, my drastically underpaid cameraman. OK, we're good. All right, welcome. OK, Josh, now that we're here, what do you see? Uh, a, a sheer drop to my death? <laughs> oh, on here. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I... That's a few minutes from now. Uh, I see a figure. There's somebody here. And a helmet, a crown, something something like that? Uh, that's a fancy hat, technical term. Technical term. Yeah. And he's holding a staff. Oh, yes, this right here. Yeah. 
So we have a staff going down here. So who is this? Josh, no question you're looking at a king. It's a king. No question. <laughs> Incredible. You're one of the only people in the world to have ever come face to face with this carving. I mean, look at this. Who's foolish enough to come up here? That's the people who carved it, <laughs> right? So, king of what? No doubt, this is a Mesopotamian king. A Mesopotamian king? Yeah, what the heck's a Mesopotamian king doing here? It does have that distinctive shape to the crown. Yeah. How do we know it's Mesopotamian? Well, because of the writing, too. Oh, there's the writing. You can see it going down. You can see them there. By your left knee, there's some really good quality preservation. This is cuneiform? Cuneiform. These little wedge-shaped cuts. This is one of the oldest scripts in the world. It's extremely distinctive. Cuneiform is an ancient writing system used in this part of the world by civilizations dating back to the Sumerians of Mesopotamia in the fourth millennia BC. It helps mark the beginning of recorded history itself. This is incredible. A whole lot of very faded cuneiform. Yeah, it's been blasted for centuries by the elements. I mean, just turn around and take a look. I'm not turning around. <laughs> I'm not not turning around. Ah, I turned around. Why did you make me turn around? Oh my God, it's so far down. <laughs> so far down. Okay, should we get to work? I'm ready if you are. Yeah, let's get to work. The Artec Leo 3D scanner will capture the inscription with incredible detail, detecting variances in the rock invisible to the naked eye. I've used this tech before, but never on anything this large. <sighs> okay, I'm got it. Swing it back. Pierce Paul and I pass the scanner back and forth to cover the entire inscription. We're almost done, guys. 40 photos a second will be stitched together to digitally view the inscription with unprecedented accuracy. So now we gotta go down, take a look at this data and see what we got. That means we can leave? You sure you just don't wanna hang around for a while? Oh my God. I'm gonna cut his rope. Let's go. Okay, we're headed down. Awesome. Awesome job. Epic. The journey to the inscription was a one-way trip. Instead of going back up, we need to rappel down to solid ground. That's a long way down. Watch the scanner on the overhang. Yep. Otherwise, we do it again tomorrow. Whew. I'm good. I'm down! Time to see what the mysterious inscription reveals. All right, moment of truth. You ready? Please, let this have worked. Oh! Oh my God, look at that! Amazing. Amazing! The detail is incredible. It's stunning, instantly. Just on the first look, I can tell so much more about this. There are so many details here that I couldn't yeah. see when we were up there. When this thing was originally discovered, they were able to read a couple of lines of text. The data we got, I can see dozens of lines. This is so awesome. And out of all of these lines of text, how many of them have been translated? Not very many. We're talking two, three, four, five percent. Single digits, small number. Okay. So maybe with this scan, with this detail, more to follow. I think not maybe. I think certainly there's more to come. So my cuneiform is a little rusty. Who is this guy? What does the text tell us? So this first sentence gives us the home run. It says, I am Nabonidus, king of Babylon. In the 6th century BC, the Babylonian king Nabonidus had spent a decade in this region conquering small tribes and settlements when he set his sights on the people living here in Sela. And we know one of the things that he is reported to have done is to bring the Edomite Empire to an end. And this monumental inscription is announcing that. This is rubbing it in. This yeah. is insult to injury. This is going to their place and saying, you're gonna remember this. Yeah, I won. Yeah. So him defeating the Edomites happens around when, we like think? 550 BC. So this really is a smoking gun saying, at this moment in time, in this place, the Edomites are destroyed. Unfortunately for them, the Babylonians didn't get to enjoy Sela for too long. Soon after taking this place from the Edomites, Babylon itself was conquered, leaving Sela without a landlord. But not for long. 
A void appears. There's a dark spot on the map. Right, nobody's here now. The Nabataeans are here now. Uh -huh. They start filling it in. This power vacuum that's here, they fill it. This is their origin story. Right, all these nomadic tribes that are out in the desert, suddenly nobody's in charge here, and there's an opportunity for them to coalesce and to come to this place. And this is one of those things where we get really lucky. Later in history, a Roman historian tells us that in 312 BC, the Nabataeans, the first time we ever hear this word, are so present, so powerful, so dynamic at Sella that they are able to fight off one of Alexander the Great's generals. Wow. Not once, but twice. Wow. Perhaps forged by generations enduring in the desert, the Nabataeans prove formidable a trait that will help propel them to great success. So here we are centuries before Petra is really a thing, yeah. and the Nabataeans are on the scene. Yes. And so what do they do with that here at Sella? Well, I can take you up and show you. They left stuff behind? Yeah, let's go take a look. We strap our packs back on and hike up to another part of the mesa. It's just as hot, but at least this time I'm not worried about how I'm getting down. Oh, wow. This looks like something you'd see at Petra. Yeah, this is where we really start to see the Nabataeans' fingerprints. This is what? The city gate. These are for doors? Yep, this allows them to block things off, control access. The Nabataeans are learning how to take the natural shape of these canyons and use it to their advantage. So, entrance to the city beyond. Yep. All right, should we see what's in there? You can see all these signs of construction. Look at this. Yeah. I mean, look at that up there. That looks exactly like Petra, that squared off carved area. I know, if these were red rocks, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Totally, that's very Nabataean looking. Using only manual tools like hammers and chisels, the Nabataeans fashioned rough looking caves and then clearly honed their skills into more refined designs. Oh, this is a house. This is a house. Here you got the front door area. You uh -huh. put your little oil lamp in here. Right, You've got. that's your front porch light. Yeah. Right? <laughs> So you've got that in the front of your house. And then we've got this pretty spacious dwelling here, right? Yeah, I mean, it's good space and it's well protected from several sides. But if you look at the holes above yeah, the all these ceiling. Like, like post holes? These are post holes. To turn this cave into a home, the Nabataeans would mount beams in the post holes, then drape fabric over them like a tarp for shade and shelter. It's pretty sophisticated, indoor, outdoor, like, like a covered porch. Absolutely. The mountain is covered with homes like this, where the Nabataeans could cease their wandering in the desert and live in safety. They took the knowledge they gained here and applied it to their capital at Petra. It's an amazing evolutionary leap, as was their ability to navigate the deserts. But then we spot the thing that made the Nabataeans a true powerhouse. Whoa. Look at the hole. Is that a water cistern? It is, it's a cistern. I mean, that is deep. That must be 20 feet deep. At least. So this is a massive water cistern. Yes, this would have held thousands and thousands of gallons. When you think about this part of the world, you don't think of water, but there must have been a ton of it here. Well, this is a big part of the secret of the Nabataeans' rise, is their ability to manage water, to direct it, to dam it. Without that technology, they don't make it. This is life. Without this, you cannot survive here, much less thrive. And this will make you think about Petra in a whole new way. Absolutely. It's all about water. We make the long drive back to Petra, and I see that Pierce is right. Within these well-protected walls, the innovation and building prowess the Nabataeans mastered in the desert is on full display. Now that we're back from Sela, you have to look at Petra through a different lens. Everything's about water management. Oh, all of this is like a channel, like an aqueduct system. And every one of these little valleys would have had dams in it. This is a big part of why Petra is Petra. Right. If your whole situation in this part of the world is about managing water, right. this is the place. Look at this valley. Right, all of the water during rains floods down through these canyons. And if you can learn to harness it, you can then take advantage of it. Got it. Today, we see Petra as surrounded by desert but it was once a resplendent oasis. Thanks to the Nabataeans' mastery of water, precisely engineered irrigation systems would have carried water to every corner of this city. The path we walk would have been surrounded by greenery and terraces of exotic fruit trees. There was even, honest to God, ancient piping. This is actual plumbing. 
Hi. Ceramic pipes like cones set one into another, and the place is plumbed, and at multiple levels in some places. But these ones that would have been open, if you were entering Petra, coming mm -hmm. down through the Seek, you would have been listening to the echoes and seeing water, flowing water. Yeah, it sets a real distinctive tone. It's like having a fountain in the foyer of your house. It's a statement. I mean, you're showing off. Right, they're doing something in the desert that you shouldn't be able to do. They have running water. And we have resources. Yeah. Look at us, yeah. look what we can do. But its greatest mystery, the truth behind the wondrous treasury, is still waiting to be solved. As we continue down the corridor of the Seek, we hear a reason to pick up the pace. Josh, here, get over here, they found something. Let's see what we got. Yeah, what is it? We got a lot more people here. Yeah. Oh, this looks very official. <laughs> Turns out, we've got company. The team is joined by the Director General of the Jordanian Department of Antiquities, Dr. Fadi Balawi. Exactly. Your Excellency, nice to meet you, sir. Lovely seeing you. Yes along with the Chief Commissioner of Petra, Dr. Ferris Brezat. Thank you for having us back. Where have you been? We've been in the desert, we've been in the desert, we're back. Really? Oh. Okay. Look at how much progress you guys have made here. Look, you're all the way down there. You guys have moved a lot of Earths. So what'd you find? We think we have an entrance to something here. There's an opening there? There's an opening. Where? I can put my oh, hand on this line. Look at that, that's a doorway. And it goes all the way to here as well. And it's just got these big blocks in front of it? Yeah, it's been sealed up. Is that a tomb? What is that? I mean, why do we have to wonder? We should go down and see. Let's find out. Yeah. Come down. I knew I liked this guy. Yeah. <laughs> We're coming down. Oh my word, can you see in there? Wow. I can't wait. What is in there? It is something really huge. Is it empty? Is it, can you see anything? Ooh. Is it a room? Does it go back? It's a new tomb, I think. It is a tomb! Oh my god.